The Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics will come to order. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to today's hearing entitled the Office of Commercial Space Transportation's Fiscal Year 2012 Budget Request. In front of your packets containing the written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures for today's witness panel. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today, May 5th, marks the 50th anniversary of the first flight of an American astronaut and the second human being into outer space. Alan Shepard, riding in a Mercury capsule, launched atop a redstone rocket on a 15-minute suborbital sub flight that carried him to an altitude of 116 miles. His flight was a major first step for America's space program, helping bolster American pride and setting our country and NASA on a spectacular course of space accomplishments. Turning to the present, I want to thank our witnesses for taking time from their busy schedules to appear before our subcommittee. I realize a lot of work by many people goes into the preparation of your statements, and I want to assure you that your expertise and wisdom will be valuable to this committee and Congress as we wrestle with issues related to our, na our nation's commercial space program. The Office of Commercial Space Transportation provides an essential public service, ensuring that commercial launches are undertaken with the highest level of safety. Their record of achievement is significant, licensing over 200 launches without any loss of life, serious injury, or notable property damage to the general public. However, over the next several years, AST, as they are commonly known within FAA and industry, faces an increased workload and possible added regulatory duties, and their FY 2012 budget request reflects these new burdens. The request seeks a 75% increase over the FY10 enacted level and an expansion of its workforce by nearly 50%. A significant portion of the increase would be sent, spent hiring additional staff to develop and implement new safety requirements for suborbital and orbitable commercial human spaceflight launch systems. AST also proposes to establish a new program modeled after NASA's Centennial Challenges Prize to incentivize development of space transportation technologies. Finally, the budget request proposes creation of a commercial spaceflight technical center at NASA's Kennedy Space Center that would initially employ a small number of aerospace engineers, but could over time hire as many as a couple hundred. The request is silent on associated infrastructure costs. With respect to commercial human spaceflight, the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004 included two provisions that will be central to our discussions today. The first authorized AST to regulate commercial human spaceflight launch systems. The second prohibited AST from regulating commercial human spaceflight for eight years in order to give space tourism companies an opportunity to design, develop, and operate new and experimental launch systems. The freeze was expected to allow the nascent industry to gain experience through experimental flights upon which AST could rely as it began to draft a regulatory regime. At the time, Congress was considering the 2004 Act. The industry expressed concern that without any real-world experience, regulation writers could choke off creation of the space tourism marketplace by writing and enforcing unworkable and overly prescriptive rules. Roughly six and a half years have elapsed since the bill's enactment, and as many in this room are aware, there's an effort underway in Congress to extend the regulatory prohibition another eight years. Given that no prototype commercial suborbital vehicle is yet flown into space, does the argument still hold that AST needs an experience base upon which it can draft regulations guiding the industry's design and operation of their vehicles? To what degree should AST regulate commercial human space launch systems? Should they have insight down to the component level for each type of launch vehicle, uh, much the same way the FAA certifies commercial civil aircraft? How would they acquire the knowledge and expertise to take on this role? It is my hope this morning's hearing will help shed light on these and other pressing questions. Before closing, I also want to express concerns about AST's proposal to create a prize program. While I appreciate government's interest in promoting technological development in the space transportation industry, it is my view that NASA is doing more than a sufficient job funding new technologies and capabilities through aggressive use of Space Act agreements. In these times when Congress and the White House are focusing on reducing the federal budget deficit, I question the wisdom of implementing another form of federal largesse. Dr. Neal, don't take this personally but I want the record to note that the FAA's testimony was provided to our committee about 20 hours ago, contrary to committee rules and past practice. 
By holding back testimony, members and staff are afforded only a handful of hours to review and analyze administration statements, undermining the ability of this body to engage in a well-informed dialogue with executive branch witnesses. The White House's process for vetting testimony of agency witnesses continues to frustrate this committee and Congress. This is not the first time in this still young Congress that testimony has arrived only hours before the scheduled start of hearings, and I urge the White House to exercise greater diligence. The chair now recognizes Mr. Costello for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, and I thank you for calling the hearing today, and let me just associate myself with your remarks about uh, testimony coming from the White House uh, in a timely manner consistent with the rules of this committee. Uh, it's been a long-standing problem. Uh, I have um, been on this committee for a number of years, and uh, we experience the same problem uh, regardless of which administration is in office. And uh, I would just say uh, to you uh, to go back, uh, Dr. Neldon, uh, express that, our frustration to, uh, re as the chairman said, don't take it personal, uh, but uh, we know the vetting process, uh, it needs to uh, uh, you, you all need to do a better job in the White House. We express that under the Bush administration. We'll continue to, uh, to express that under the, uh, under the Obama administration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very familiar with uh, commercial space transportation and the uh, commercial space transportation industry, not only uh, from the hearings that I chaired uh, in the Aviation Subcommittee, but also the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, which is well known for designing and managing public competition for aviation and space. Uh, they are located across the river uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, from my congressional district in southwestern Illinois. Uh, AST's 12, uh, fiscal year 12 budget uh, request reflects the office's changing role as the commercial space flight industry expands to provide cargo and crew transportation for NASA build spaceports around the country, transport space tourists, and fulfill other missions. Congress and the FAA will need to decide how best to proceed with respect to safety regulations of this emerging industry. Congress passed several laws to allow commercial space transportation to develop, and we must ensure the industry has proper federal safety oversight. As the number of launches is expected to increase with commercial space tourism and the potential use of commercial space launch vehicles, by NASA. It is imperative that the FAA has the proper resources to ensure new technologies and programs evolve safely. I look forward to hearing from the FAA Associated, Associated Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation uh, about the FAA's role in overseeing the commercial space industry to ensure the safety of the public as well as crew and space flight, flight uh, participants. Uh, I hope this hearing will be the first of many substantive hearings by this committee to examine the current status and future challenges of commercial space operations. We need to determine our goals for the Office of Commercial Space Transportation and evaluate the issues we must consider for the future of the AST. I welcome our witnesses and look forward to hearing their testimony. And again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Costello. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witness panel. Our first witness is Dr. George Neal, uh, Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA. He has over 30 years of aerospace experience with the Air Force at NASA in private industry. Dr. Neal came to FAA from the Orbital Sciences Corporation, where he served as senior scientist for the Advanced Programs Group. Our next witness is Dr. Gerald Dillingham, uh, Director of Civil Aviation Issues at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. He is responsible for directing program evaluations and policy analysis related to all aspects of civilian aviation, including safety, finance, environment, air traffic control, airport development, and international aviation issues. Our final witness is Dr. Henry Hertzfeld. Uh, research Professor of space, space Policy and International Affairs in the Space Policy Institute at the Elliott School of International Affairs and an adjunct professor of law at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Welcome to all of you. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Dr. George Neal, Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA. Chairman Palazzo, Congressman Costello, and members of the subcommittee. 
Thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing on the activities of the Federal Aviation Administration Office of Commercial Space Transportation. This is my first opportunity to speak to many of you, so I'm particularly pleased to be here. I know the subcommittee is specifically interested in the administration's FY 2012 budget request for AST, and I would also like to update the subcommittee on some of our recent activities and to offer a view of the future. The mission of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation is to ensure protection of the public, property, and the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States during commercial launch and reentry activities, and to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space transportation. While we take all of our statutory charges seriously, our top priority is safety. To carry out our safety responsibilities, we develop and issue regulations, grant licenses, permits, and safety approvals, and conduct safety inspections during every licensed or permitted launch. To date, we have an unblemished safety record, 204 licensed launches without any loss of life, serious injuries, or significant property damage to the general public. We are also responsible for licensing the operation of launch and reentry sites, or spaceports. Since 1996, we have licensed the operation of eight different spaceports around the country. Last year, the FAA awarded four grants for spaceport development. We believe these investments will enhance safety and facilitate future development efforts. The capability to accomplish important commercial space transportation research was significantly enhanced last fall through the establishment of the Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation, led by New Mexico State University. The Center of Excellence is a partnership between government, industry, and academia, and will carry out research necessary to maintain U.S. leadership in commercial space transportation safety and technologies. Fifty years ago, on May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to travel into space. But today, we find ourselves at a crossroads. Next month, NASA will carry out the final launch of the space shuttle. While this is a bittersweet event for all space enthusiasts, it is also an exciting time and an opportunity to begin the next chapter in space transportation. After the completion of Atlantis's final mission, NASA is planning to rely on private industry to launch cargo and eventually crew members to and from the International Space Station, thereby enabling NASA to focus its attention on exploring the solar system. It will be the FAA's responsibility to license and regulate those commercial launches to the ISS. One of the most important contributors to our near-term workload will be suborbital space flights. In FY 2012, we expect to see several dozen licensed or permitted launches, many of which will involve suborbital flights. That will mark a significant increase in activity for us and it represents the start of what is likely to be a period of sustained and rapid growth. The administration's FY 2012 budget request for AST totals approximately $26.6 million and provides for 103 full-time employees. The request includes funding for a commercial spaceflight technical center at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and a low-cost access to space incentive program. I would be happy to discuss each of these initiatives in more detail if there is interest. Commercial space transportation is currently undergoing a number of changes, and as the regulator, we need to be prepared to change along with the industry. For example, in the coming months, it may be necessary to revisit some of the statutes and regulations that govern commercial space launch activities. Specifically, the FAA's legislative authority may require revision so that we can continue to ensure public safety, both in space and on the ground. We see the potential need for greater regulatory authority in the area of on-orbit transportation, as well as during launch and reentry. We welcome the opportunity to work with Congress on these priorities. Chairman Palazzo, Congressman Costello, and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Neal. I now recognize our second witness, Dr. Gerald Dillingham, Director of Civil Aviation Issues for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Costello, members of the subcommittee. 
My testimony this morning focuses on three areas. First, the recent trends in the commercial space launch industry, and second, FY12 budget requests for FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, or AST. And third, some of the key challenges that FAA and the industry will need to address as the industry matures. Regarding the trends in the industry, after reaching a peak of 22 launches in 1998, the frequency of commercial space launches began to fluctuate and generally declined until an uptick occurred in 2004. In 2004, five manned commercial test flights took place, and since that time, additional manned flights have been anticipated but have not materialized. However, other trends seem to indicate that the number of commercial launches is expected to increase. For example, there has been an increase in R&D activities, including low-altitude flight tests of reusable rocket-powered vehicles that are capable of takeoffs and landings. We also see where private companies and states are developing additional spaceports to accommodate anticipated space tourism flights and expand the nation's launch capacity. In 2006, there were six FAA licensed spaceports. In 2011, the number has increased to eight. Additional commercial spaceports have been proposed in Hawaii, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Now let's turn to AST's FY12 budget requests. FAA expects the number of commercial launches will increase over the next several years for several reasons. First, the first space tourism flights are expected to begin within two years with several launches occurring each year. Second, NASA plans to use private companies to transport cargo and eventually personnel to the, to the International Space Station. FAA also expects its workload to increase over the next several years as it begins to develop safety regulations for these flights. So it has significantly increased its budget request. FAA's FY12 budget request would increase the budget for AST by nearly 75 percent over FY10 budget to about 27 million in FY12. According to FAA, this would fund nearly a 45 percent increase in staffing from 71 FTEs in F FY10 to 103 in FY12. This request also asks for a five million dollar increase in spending on the office space incentive awards program. From our perspective, FAA's focus on the need to expand its expertise in the areas of human factor and human spaceflight appear reasonable. However, the timing of the requested increase given the current federal budget situation and uncertainties as to when and how much FAA's workload will expand warrants careful consideration by the Congress. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, let's turn to the challenges we see on the horizon for FAA's oversight for the industry as it continues to mature. First, FAA must ensure that its regulations on licensing and safety requirements for launches and launch sites, which are based on safety requirements for expendable launch vehicle operations at federal sites, will also be suitable for operations at private sector space ports. A second challenge for FAA is its dual mandate to regulate safety and promote human spaceflight. FAA and Congress must remain vigilant to ensure that any relationship between FAA and the commercial space launch industry remains appropriate. A third challenge for FAA will, will be to ensure that planning and implementation of next gen accommodate spacecraft that are traveling to and from space through the national airspace system. For the industry, a key challenge going forward will be maintaining a strong international competitive position for the U.S. commercial space launch industry. Foreign competitors have, have historically offered lower launch prices than U.S. providers. As the commercial space launch industry expands, high launch costs and export controls will affect its ability to sell its services abroad. Finally, an overarching challenge for the industry and the U.S. is the lack of a comprehensive national space launch strategy. Numerous federal agencies have responsibilities for space activities, including FAA, NASA, DOD, State, and Commerce. According to a 2009 National Academy, of, uh, National Academy of Sciences study, a process of alignment offers the opportunity to leverage resources from various agencies to address such shared cha challenges as the diminishing space industrial base, the dwindling technical workforce, and reduced funding levels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Dylan Ham. I now recognize our final witness, Dr. Henry Hertzfeld, Research Professor of Space Policy and International Affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University.
Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm pleased that the committee has begun the important process of reviewing these matters as the space industry in the United States is poised for very significant changes. Reviewing the findings of the congressionally mandated 2008 study of human safety regulations and noting important changes in the development of commercial space as well as the environment of space itself, I'll discuss both near-term and long-term issues that will need congressional review. First, because there have been no commercial suborbital flights yet, the experimental period for the licensing uh, of human suborbital flights will need to be extended. The time period should not have a limit determined by an arbitrary number of years, but should be measured by developing indicators of the maturity of the industry and the risks involved. I'd recommend that the FAA, perhaps Comstack or an independent study, uh, determine these types of market indicators. At a future point, when and if suborbital commercial flights develop into, marketable, into a marketable service, the regulatory oversight should be transitioned to other parts of the FAA, since these flights will be within airspace and closer in form to aviation than space. The second issue is an inherent conflict when one agency has the dual mandate to both regulate and promote. The 2008 study found no complaints from industry about the OCST's dual roles. This, though, should be carefully monitored, and the promotional aspects might eventually have to be shifted to other agencies to preserve the integrity of the regulatory process. A related conflict of interest problem in the form of one office regulating different competing modes of transportation, in this case ELVs, RLBs, suborbital flights, and possibly even UAVs, also raise issues of fairness, undue influence, and in the end of making difficult objective decisions regarding safety. In the 2008 study, we noted that there was overlapping jurisdiction in determining who will have the lead if there's a serious commercial space accident. The FAA OCST, through an agreement, delegates that lead to the NTSB which the NTSB at present does not have a congressional mandate to uh, investigate space transportation accidents. Also, a law enacted after the Columbia accident, primarily focused on the shuttle and the space station, requires a presidential commission to be formed to lead an accident investigation. However, that same law also applies to a commercial space vehicle that is carrying a government payload. Although all agencies have, have in the past cooperated fully in these investigations, only one should have the lead responsibility. A uniform United States approach to regulating in-orbit space activities will become necessary and should be integrated with the licensing procedures for commercial space operations. Difficult issues of in-orbit liability will need to be studied very carefully, actually, before these rules are promulgated. At present, within the United States, the existing very limited and uncoordinated in-orbit rules are split among the FCC, NOAA, and the FAA. These should be coordinated. In addition, there are many international dimensions to in-orbit regulations. If the United States does not take a leadership role and initiate action in this area soon, other nations will. This could lead to international rules that might have negative effects on the growth of U.S. commercial space operations. As we regulate in-orbit activities, the regulatory regime should be clearly delineated between those vehicles that intend to go to outer space and those that will remain within airspace. The regulatory difference involves international obligations the United States has agreed to under the space treaties. A new distinction needs to be, made, needs to be clearly made between suborbital vehicles and vehicles that enter outer space but are not intended to achieve orbit. Finally, Congress might want to revisit the informed consent rules in the CSLA for space participants. I have two suggestions there. One is that the FAA be responsible for drafting clauses dealing with information to be given to the space flight participant on accident risk history and other data that the FAA is in a better position to provide than private companies. These clauses should be required to be included in the consent form. However, the companies are still responsible for drafting the form and making it specific to their vehicles. And secondly, states are starting to compete with their own passenger, wa with their own passenger waivers of liability to the private operator. Currently, Florida, Virginia, and recently New Mexico and Texas have these laws, each with different wording. Federal preemption on this issue might be warranted to prevent competition among states 
on an issue that involves interstate commerce and may adversely affect safety decisions the companies uh, make concerning the vehicle and operations. Thank you. I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Hertzfeld. I thank the panel for their testimony, reminding members that committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair will at this point open the round of questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Dr. Neal, uh, your, your budget request appears to be premised in part on the expiration of the eight-year regulatory prohibition at the end of calendar year 2012. In the event that the pro prohibition lapses, how will AST approach the task of drafting a framework for regulating commercial human space flight in the absence of real, any real experience? Uh, in question two, uh, assuming AST desires to put in place a structure that is workable and won't choke the fledgling space tourism marketplace with overly prescriptive regulations, how would AST go about the task of reg regulating an industry that for all practical purposes doesn't exist yet? Thank you for that question. Certainly the development of regulations to ensure the safety of flight crew and space flight participants is on our to-do list. That's something we're focused on, thinking about, talking about. But until the congressional moratorium is lifted, then we would not be in a position to issue any new regulations. However, we do have responsibility to regulate the operations and safety of the emerging commercial human space flight industry as Congress specified in the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004. And so we would propose using the tools that we have at our disposal, including the issuing of, of licenses, permits, and safety approvals, and conducting safety inspections to ensure that safety. We also continue to have the responsibility to ensure the safety of the general public on the ground. And so we are in a position today to be responsible for, as I said, 204 license launches that have already occurred. So industry is present. What's new now is the emergence of the commercial human space flight. And that is really taking two different directions as it goes forward. One, the commercial crew development in support of the NASA space station, which is coming in the next few years. And the second is the suborbital space tourism activities. So both of those are very important. I think they, they warrant different approaches, and we're trying to prepare for, for both uh, pieces of the industry's activities. Do you, can you elaborate on the different approaches between the two? I think inherently the suborbital flights and the orbital flights are, are different. On the suborbital side, you have an opportunity for incremental step-by-step -step flight testing. And, of course, that's what we, we saw with the Spaceship One winning the X Prize back in 2004. And now we have a number of companies that are designing, building, testing vehicles for that type of an operation. And we expect to see a, a number of flight tests in the very near future. But those flights will tend to be just 10 to 20 minutes long in the, in the space flight portion of it, and they're relatively benign in terms of the environmental conditions. On the orbital side, you can do lots of analysis, you can do lots of ground testing, but once you're ready to go to space, you light the rocket engine and you pretty much need to go all the way to orbit. So that's really a, a different scenario, and of course we do have 50 years of experience with, with NASA conducting those human space flights to orbit that we can draw on uh, in terms of preparing some top-level guidance and, and safety standards for, for industry. So we're not really starting with a, a clean sheet. We would propose working closely with NASA and the industry in preparing the, the overall guidance. Another question, Dr. Neal. Uh, to what level of detail does AST plan to regulate commercial human launch systems seeking a permit or license? For instance, does AST plan to get down to the component level of each system, approving their design, operation, and maintenance? And will you require several levels of redundancy for each critical system? I think someday we'll end up with a, a certification process that is very similar to what the FAA does for aviation. And so that might well entail going down to the system and subsystem level and, and components and so forth. That's led to an incredible safety record for aviation. But I think it's too early to try to do that kind of thing for space transportation today. 
And so our approach has been to have top-level system safety performance-based regulations that do not dictate the particular kinds of designs or particular kinds of operations that are being proposed, but rather make sure that we have the right kind of end result, which is to ensure the safety of the public on the ground and to the extent possible to also ensure the safety of those on board. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Costello. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Dr. Neal, um, we all agree that safety is the, the number one responsibility of, um, of all of us when it comes to, uh, to this issue. You, you indicated that uh, the FAA is trying to prepare uh, for uh, uh, putting regulations into place for human space uh, transportation. Uh, can you tell us where you are right now? I mean, uh, where are we as far as planning is concerned? Okay, so just to briefly review, we have had and continue to have regulations in place to protect the safety of those on the ground. And right. so many of the rockets that are being proposed for launching commercial crew have already been flying under FAA licenses. What's new is the, the, having the people on board. So we've known this was coming. We've been studying. We've been talking. We've been debating. We've been researching to find the best practices within NASA and the industry on how best to do that. Uh, we've worked very closely with NASA on their proposed human rating draft requirements that have already been issued. And in fact, we've just announced a public meeting down in Cape Canaveral later on this month that would allow industry and NASA and others to talk to us about the recommendations that they would have on a regulatory approach. In your opinion at this point, what uh, criteria uh, or information do you think the FAA needs to begin to establish uh, regulations? I think we have the, the basic information that is needed. We have the 50 years of human spaceflight experience gathered by NASA. We have um, 50 years of experience that the FAA has in, in regulating the aviation community. and. Uh, 204 licensed commercial launches. What we really need at this point is good communication and coordination between the parties involved. In order for this industry to be successful, we can't afford to have a, one set of requirements for NASA missions and one set of requirements for FAA regulations. That would not allow industry to close their business cases and it would be needlessly inefficient. So we need to work together to ensure that we have consistent and compatible requirements. And you mentioned that uh, you're working with NASA now. Is that uh, relationship, would you uh, um, tell the committee that it is working well? You feel that you're, you're working cooperatively? I think we've, we've made good strides there. Frankly, our 2012 budget request has a key enabler for that cooperation, and that is the Commercial Space Flight Technical Center at KSC. We view that as an excellent opportunity not only to potentially hire some of the experienced workforce that is going to be searching for work in the months ahead, but also to be basically co-located with NASA to build that cadre of subject matter, matter experts on uh, engineering standards and launch operations. Uh, as you know, the um, FAA reauthorization that passed the House uh, has an extension of the prohibition uh, and would extend for eight years after the first license launch of a space flight participant. I understand that the, um, that may move uh, the prohibition to maybe the year 20, 2020 and that the FAA may have some concerns with that. Can you express the concerns that the FAA may have? Yes, I very much understand the the intent of the original moratorium, which was the fear that the government could stifle industry and prevent it from doing creative and original experimentation to, to really get its feet on the ground. And although there have not been commercial human space flights since 2004, I think our office's dual mandate of ensuring public safety and to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry gives us a unique perspective to be able to recognize that the only way to be truly safe is not to fly at all. So we understand the delicate balance there, 
and we would propose to uh, have the option to be able to take advantage of trends, of best practices, of lessons learned, of anomalies during flight tests. If something should start to appear as an indicator of problems, which was talked about by Dr. Dellingham, then we want to be able to move quickly to be able to uh, allow all to take advantage of those lessons learned rather than uh, potentially having future accidents. So we're not ready to uh, burden the industry today. We just want to focus on safety and, and try to allow experimentation and creativity as we go forward in a safe manner. Dr. Dillingham, would you comment on the prohibition of the extension? Yes, Mr. Costello. Um, I think uh, I think we are pretty much in line across the panel with regard to the uh, extension of the prohibition. Uh, it's not clear to us uh, at the GAO what is the basis of the eight years. Um, we we would be um, in the in the line of sort of um, incrementally looking at what's going on at that point and moving as uh, as you get more information. But the caution, that, the caution that we make with regard to sort of the, the eight year is uh, be careful uh, about making uh, regulations in times of crisis. That is, if, if, if the industry, if, if there's an accident and all of a sudden we're trying to make regulations, sometimes it doesn't quite work out the way that the Congress wants it to work out when they don't have the, the time to, to deliberate, and FAA in the same way. So we, we're for incrementalism. We don't see any basis for eight years. You got a new chairman here now. <laughs> um, we have a vote on right now, and uh, we will continue this discussion after the vote. And I would expect that would be in about 15 or 20 minutes. So, uh, if we could recess here, I say uh, the subcommittee is recessed for 20 minutes. Uh, the Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics will come to order. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, sticking around while we had to do our business on the floor. And uh, Mr. Costello, uh, the ranking member, has had his option. And are we going to give the chair back? Uh, no. Uh, well, uh, we will now proceed uh, with questions for our panel. And uh, Mr. Brooks from Alabama will uh, proceed with uh, your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman. We've got two of them right now. Um, you know, we're facing a $1.6 trillion deficit, which I would submit to you is a, a very serious threat to our country. Uh, could result in a federal government insolvency or bankruptcy if we don't get it addressed. And I see where you're asking for a 75 percent, or AST is asking for a 75 percent funding increase. And then also look at the word commercial. And when I see the word commercial, I see uh, little or no government involvement, uh, not substantial or significant uh, government involvement. To me, uh, commercial means free enterprise and, and private sector as opposed to uh, something that the government has a heavy hand of managing or subsidizing. I also see commercial as meaning that there's a profit motive, and that's the reason for the commercial activity, is that uh, there is a way that uh, someone in the private sector can do something faster or cheaper or better uh, than perhaps the government or its competitors, and hence they can make a profit because they're able to do that better or faster or cheaper. Now, um, of this 15 million that was budgeted in FY 2010 and 27 million that is requested in FY 2012, uh, Dr. Neal, can you tell me how much of this is paid for? Uh, by the commercial space entities via either license fees or taxes or some other source of revenue? None of it. 
because under current law we are not allowed to charge for licenses that we issue. Well, well you've often used the FAA uh, as an analogy with um, a commercial uh, flight. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the FAA's budget uh, significantly paid for through um, ticket taxes, uh, landing fees, fuel taxes, and things of that nature? That is a significant component of overall FAA expenditures. And so as the industry development develops, I, th I think it certainly is appropriate to think about whether similar um, ideas can be incorporated for space transportation. The, the problem is with a relatively low number of launches taking place, then if you try to uh, cover the cost per ticket, per passenger, per rocket, that ends up putting additional burdens on the industry, which is, is going to uh, have a negative impact on, on the U.S. efforts. Well, that kind of brings us to another question that I had. Um, with respect to the low number of launches, why is it that we have that low number? There's a variety of different reasons for that. I think in, in recent years, the U.S. has not been competitive with the rockets that are offered by, by other countries. In other countries, the space programs tend to be very much uh, part of the government efforts. I think the United States is, is rather unique in that we do have a commercial industry. In, in recent years, DOD and NASA contracts with industry have perhaps caused the U.S. efforts to uh, not be as competitive as we'd like to see them. But I think recently there's been some new entrants to the industry, some new ideas, some new entrepreneurial spirit, and we're seeing some of the prices come down, and I think that's going to lead to the U.S. market share eventually growing back to where we'd like to see that in the future. If I recall correctly, AST was created sometime around 1984, is that? That's correct. So it's been in existence for more than a quarter of a century, and uh, commercial launches uh, appear to be on the decline rather than the increase. Might that be because, at least as of now, there is little to no commercial viability? I would uh, disagree with that assessment. Uh, I think the the progress of the industry has been slower than people would have liked to see but as we look at what we're seeing now in terms of research development plans c contracts customers uh, there is a lot bubbling out in the world right now and i think we're about to see a, a rapid increase in a variety of different parts of the industry whether it's space tourism or commercial involvement to allow nasa uh, to get low, lower cost transportation to low Earth orbit so that it can concentrate on exploration and a variety of different other programs. Uh, is there any impact on the commercial viability uh, of these private ventures uh, caused by the regulatory atmosphere of AST? Stated differently, are the AST regulations increasing the cost of being commercially viable, which in turn means that they're less commercially viable or not commercially viable, which means that they don't do it? I would state that we are not a cause of that. And I think it would be important for the committee to, to talk to industry to get their impressions. But I believe that the regulations that we have in place are very much focused on safety while allowing industry to uh, take the steps that are appropriate to have viable businesses. Well, thank you. I'm, as you may know, I'm, I'm just a lowly freshman on this panel uh, trying to learn the ropes. This is my first exposure to this particular issue, and I very much appreciate your candor, and I yield the remainder of my time. I now recognize uh, Mrs. Edwards from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses today. This is an, um, an issue that I've had a longstanding interest in and in just trying to understand uh, what the role and responsibility of the commercial sector is with respect to, um, uh, to the commercial space industry and how that relates also to the responsibilities that we have as a government and our agencies, particularly NASA, FAA, and others um, have. So I appreciate your testimony. And I, like others, want to express that I share 
uh, the hope that this is just a, the first of a series of hearings that we hold uh, on commercial space transportation because there are a number of issues that I think it's important to address and understand well prior uh, to a robust industry being developed. Um, we have to understand the implications of having FAA as both the regulator of commercial space transportation safety and the promoter of the industry it's regulating. As we know, FAA used to have that dual responsibility for the commercial airline industry until Congress withdrew uh, the FAA role for both promoting the industry um, and, uh, and regulating the industry, and that was because of a perceived conflict of interest um, and so that the agency could focus on safety. I think that we have um, some very similar concerns uh, right now and rather than waiting until the point where we know there's a problem and have to withdraw the authority, we should deal with that um, at the outset. I think as well as NASA moves forward um, to work more closely and intimately with the private sector, these issues of safety, regulatory authority, liability uh, in commercial space will need to be uh, addressed pretty rigorously to ensure the safety of the public and individuals in space or near space as well as those of us who are on the ground. Um, so Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your holding the hearing today because I think it's an important and timely uh, topic. And uh, I have just a, a couple of uh, questions and probably we'll have some additional for the, uh, for the record. And I've been particularly concerned about this question of indemnification and liability. Uh, because unlike uh, when uh, NASA launches, even with commercial um, payloads or um, purely government payloads and personnel, there's a deep, close relationship there, and I can envision in an environment where you would have, say, a tourist on board, it's not like an astronaut, where an astronaut might have specific technical expertise and responsibilities, has been engaged in the program all along and understands the vehicle and those sort of things. Um, if I go in space, and I might want to be one of those if I win the lottery and can afford a ticket, um, I, I hope that nobody gives me any technical responsibility on the vehicle. I just want to be there, but I want to get up get back and be safe. And so uh, and I, it's difficult also to imagine who the private insurer is out there who will indemnify me um, and uh, as, as a tourist. And I don't want that to be the responsibility of the American taxpayer because uh, some of us can afford to go into space and think that would be a great vacation. So I wonder if you could speak about the indemnification responsibilities, liability, where that falls on the private sector versus on the, um, uh, on the government and on the taxpayer. Yes, thank you. That's a, an excellent question. Uh, Congress in the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004 went on the record and said space flight is inherently risky and they told the FAA how we should handle the carrying of people on board rockets, and that is using uh, an approach known as informed consent. So these operators are going to have to thoroughly brief those ticket buyers on all the things that co could go wrong, all the possible risks and hazards, and if they understand that and are still willing to go, they would have to sign the paperwork and then be allowed to participate. So it is very different from stepping on an airliner with the expectation that you're going to arrive safely at your destination. In terms of the overall risk sharing and liability system that we have in place today, there's a three-tier system. The FAA assesses the possible risks and things that could go wrong during a flight, and we come up with a number known as the MPL, the maximum probable loss, and we use that to establish how much insurance the launch operator has to go buy. And that would be up, or up to the level of the MPL or, or uh, $500 million, whichever is less. The second tier then is what has come to be known as indemnification. And so the Secretary could ask the Congress to appropriate funds up to a billion and a half dollars above that amount. If it's a really, really bad day and the damages are, are greater than that amount, then the liability reverts to the operator. So all of that is talking about third-party damages. Right now we have no intention of having the taxpayers subsidize any claims or uh, complaints or injuries for those who fly on these vehicles. Thank you. With that, I yield. And I just would say that um, there is where I will become a real fiscal hawk uh, coming out of this pretty liberal 
Democrat because there's no way the taxpayer should run the, that kind of risk with a purely private program. Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Adams from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank the panel for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I am very concerned about the budget which has been proposed by AST in fiscal year 2012. I would like to specifically address Dr. Field first and then other members if I have time. But Dr. Neal, in your testimony, you state AST is responsible for the safe operation of commercial companies and promotion of a robust commercial human spaceflight industry. However, in your testimony, you reference regulating space industry or the development of new regulations 11 times. You mentioned six times the eventual or planned possibilities for a robust commercial market without any basis for this development in the next two years, and never once mentioned jobs or free market solutions or economic development. This is kind of troubling to me. The ST is asking for a 74 percent increase in its budget over the 2010 enacted level because it wants to prepare and implement regulations for an industry that in the last 20 years has only re required 204 instances of regulatory intervention through some kind of license in the last 20 years. Last year, ASC oversaw four commercial orbital launches and no suborbital flights. And yet in your testimony, Dr. Neal, you said AST expects six license and permit applications, 40 launch or reentry operation inspections, eight launch site inspections, five environmental assessments, plus new rulemaking procedures. My concern is the administration is asking this committee to believe that after an eight-year moratorium on regulation and an extension of the moratorium in the wings, your office is going to require an expansion of government regulations, spending, and staff, which to me just defies logic and good sense. I have a couple of quick questions. In your testimony, you say, quote, the high cost of access to space has long been a major obstacle for civil, military, and commercial space programs. The dream of low-cost, fully reusable space launch systems has recently demonstrated by the X Prize competi competitions, but only to suborbital space, end quote. Do you believe the dream of low-cost access to space will be closer within your grasp or our grasp with a 74 percent increase in your regulatory agency's budget? If we spend it correctly, I believe it will. And certainly some of the programs that we have proposed, including the in incentive program, the center of excellence, and a number of other activities uh, are designed to enable commercial industry to be successful, which is our hope and, and objective. So you believe the expansion of regulatory authority is the best way to encourage the development of commercial space? By itself, regulations have the potential to, to shut down the industry, and, and that is not our objective. At the same time, in order for industry to be successful, it's helpful to have a common set of well-understood standards that all can follow so that we would avoid And which would take 74 percent increase of your budget. I think if we, if we look at the particular proposals, which include incentive programs and the Commercial Space Flight Technical Center, those are the kinds of things that would be helpful to the industry to allow them to be successful in the future. Do you have any concern that the development, evolution, and growth of a regulatory regime based on very little data or information on what to expect from vehicle design or human rating standards encourages a market environment of stability that an investor would want to take on? I've had a number of discussions with uh, industry leaders and that's exactly what they are asking for. They are very fearful that we will end up with separate and conflicting requirements from NASA with its programs for the space station and, and other activities and the FAA as the designated regulator for this industry. And they want to ensure that we have a consistent and compatible set of requirements. And so that's why it's so important for us to work closely with NASA to take advantage of that 50 years of human space flight experience, which is a long time. I have a, uh, I'm get one last question, hopefully. Uh, April 28, 2011, AST published a notice on its website that it will hold a public meeting late this month in Florida to seek input from the affected community. Are you expecting to issue your first round of regulations on December 24, 2012, if the eight-year moratorium expires? No, we are not. I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you. We'll now recognize Mr. Wu from Oregon. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Neild, uh, I had a set of questions uh, about commercialization and, uh, and, and other issues which uh, I, I think uh, need to be answered. And uh, I am now going to uh, give those questions to committee staff and have them submitted to you and uh, ask for uh, responses in writing. Because your answer to a prior question I thought would have elicited a gasp from this audience, which is basically that when we commercialize, uh, people should not have an expectation of safety, that it's very different from getting aboard an airliner, and that we should have informed consent, sign a disclosure form, and then uh, you board uh, the, the, the booster and, and, and vehicle, and then you take your chances. Now. I, 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 I'm just stunned. I am absolutely stunned about that characterization of the future of commercial human space flight. Now, Dr. Neal, uh, there are a couple of consequences from this, the, this picture that you've painted. And one is that any launch failure which hurts people or kills people uh, there, there are immense consequences in addition to killing people, which is uh, something that, uh, that we should strive uh, with every energy to, to avoid. It would also uh, potentially flatten the space program for a period of years, just as it did after uh, fatal events uh, in the space shuttle and, and prior. Uh, it, it, isn't that a likely consequence, and, and that's the risk that we're taking in the scenario that you paint? That is a, a very important risk, and, and that is why it is so important that we have good safety processes in place. That's why we have the regulations that we do, and on the commercial side, that's why they have the need to pay attention to safety as well, because not only are they potentially losing their mission, their rocket, the people on board, but that has the potential to, to wipe out that business if there is a serious accident. So I think they're focused correctly on doing things safely. Uh, in terms of the informed consent process, uh, that is the direction that the Congress has given us, and so we're following that to the best of our ability in the future. Okay, I, I, I just want to set aside the commercial satellite uh, side of this and focus on the potential for commercial human flight. Mm -hmm. And we basically treat human spaceflight very differently. And I'm just very concerned that any fatalities would cause a uh, dramatic pause in U.S. human spaceflight activity to the detriment of our, our national interests. And apparently you're saying that uh, we, we can't prevent that currently. Our office will do anything we can to ensure safe operations going forward. However, with all due respect, I would point out that all forms of transportation have accidents, have fatalities, whether it's in cars, airplanes, boats, and trains. And so <coughs> the nation needs to understand that that is part of the risk of exploring the unknown, of, of doing new things. And we should anticipate that, try to prevent it where we can, but not let that deter us from moving forward and advancing technology so that the United States can remain as a leader well, in space flight. Well, I, I'm not, and, and that is my goal, to have the United States remain a leader, and I'm concerned that fatalities uh, will uh, undermine our ability to do that because, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a pause as happened after Challenger and Columbia, uh, which were you know, federal projects, uh, and that was bad enough. I, I suspect that with a private venture, uh, the, the effects would be even more dire. Uh, let, let me pull you to a slightly different issue, because I, I think the loss of life and the loss of leadership in space are the most important ones. But if there is an accident like that, uh, in a private venture, uh, we are talking about public indemnity, taxpayer indemnity uh, for damages, whereas uh, when it's a federal venture, uh, in essence, the, the government is self-insured. So we're taking on an extra cost, are we not, uh, when, when, we, uh, when we put the risk in a commercial space venture for human spaceflight? 
On the contrary, I would say that under the current liability risk sharing scheme, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, there is a requirement in order to get the FAA license to purchase insurance from these commercial entities. And so uh, to that extent, it is a, a better deal for the taxpayer than a, an all-government program which uses all of the taxpayer well, money. Wasn't the thrust of, of Congresswoman Edwards' question that there would have to be some kind of liability cap and that the federal government assume risk beyond that? The current law involves this three-tier system, but the, the basic first tier is composed of insurance that the companies are required to buy by FAA regulations. Yes, but uh, that's the point, that there, are, that there are additional tiers beyond that. That's true. And I was private entities are not going to assume all of the risk, the, the potential high cost. That is a, an important factor, and we need to look at how competitive the, the U.S. endeavors are compared to other countries that, that do not have different tiers. Uh, I would point out that in the 25 years of, of operation, uh, not a dime of taxpayer dollars has ever been used. We have never had to exercise that liability risk sharing scheme. So, but it is very important to have that in place in order to give some certainty to the businesses that their liability is capped. Yes, but you're proposing changes uh, both on the commercial s satellite side and, and, uh, uh, and human space flight. So, so the risk profile is changing. Uh, pardon me if I gave that impression. I'm not proposing any changes to the liability. I, I mean the flight profiles and, and the numbers and, and, and the missions. We hope to see lots of launches, and, and that's going to help insurers to get confidence in the, in the business if we do it well, and, and that could be a win-win for all. But I'm not proposing any changes to the liability regimes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for permitting me to, uh, to go, go beyond, a little bit beyond my time, but I, I may come back to this line of questioning. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, now we recognize Mr. Rohrbacher from California. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me identify myself with the questions of uh, uh, Mrs. Adams, uh, who I think was uh, trying to get to uh, a very important heart of the issue of, of today's discussion. However, for my friend Mr. Wu, uh, the Congress specifically voted on informed consent and limited liability and informed consent. I know I'm the author of the amendment. I was told not to bring it to the floor. It wouldn't pass. We brought it to the floor. It passed by a vote of the Congress and then went on to be voted by the Senate. So I think that might have been before you were here, however. But it was when I was chairman of this committee, uh, subcommittee that is. So informed consent is part of it, and that may or may not be a, a policy that uh, you want to continue past a certain time period uh, after our technology and after uh, this new type of uh, transportation system has been developed. Let us just note that we have had uh, uh, certain other industries that have benefited by this type of approach by limiting liability. We do know that uh, uh, it has been long recognized that uh, uh, overcoming gravity is not the uh, most serious obstacle that has to be overcome. Quite often, overcoming the power of trial lawyers is at least uh, as an equal challenge. Uh, and not necessarily overcoming gravity may be much more beneficial to mankind in establishing that uh, capability rather than just overcoming trial lawyers. Uh, uh, with that said, uh, uh, about expanding your, your budget, um, let me just note idle hands. They said idle hands are the devil's tool. I mean, and idle, idle government regulators uh, with looking for something to do could actually be of greater concern than being uh, idle hands in the private sector. Um, if we are not going to be increasing the regulatory scope of your operation, uh, and, it, and it actually this uh, 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 situation, this prohibition is extended, uh, why do you need a bigger budget? I mean, isn't, aren't we just calling for Ms., what Mrs. Adams was pointing to? Uh, we now are bringing on a bigger staff, but your responsibilities 
if we do, which I think we should, which is continue this prohibition, that your really responsibilities haven't been expanded. Well, I would beg to differ. I think uh, the responsibilities potentially are increasing as the industry is increasing, and we would like to be prepared to do what we can to enable the successful growth. And so if you look at where we were in, in past years in terms of the small number of launches and where we expect to be in, in 2012, I expect, again, a, a tenfold increase in the number of launches. Uh, we need to follow through on those uh, license okay. applications. Sure do the evaluations, make sure they're safe, process those. We need to have our safety inspectors to make sure that we're doing all we can to ensure safe and successful operations. Right. We've also tried to come up with some other ideas, including the Commercial Space Flight Technical Center and the prize and, and okay. other ideas that would hold out some incentive. Well, at a time, let me put it this way, at a time when uh, we have a trillion and a half dollar deficit and we're trying to find ways of cutting across the board, it might be, uh, uh, beneficial to try to see if we can use the staffs that we already have and the budgets that we already have by giving people more responsibilities uh, and uh, uh, thus maybe getting more productivity out of our offices. Uh, let me uh, uh, just note that, that if we have a variety, for Mr. Wu's sake, if we do have a variety of spacecraft uh, uh, where we have uh, to choose from, rather than just one governmental system, which some people seem to be pushing to have, NASA's got to be in charge. We've got to have the NASA alternative. Well, if we just have the NASA alternative as compared to three or four commercial activities, once there is an accident, we're shut down, as we saw with, uh, as we saw with the space shuttle. Uh, instead, if we have various alternatives in the private sector, there's a big benefit to be able to, to ease over to another alternative rather than just putting it all on the government's shoulders, no matter what the liability question is there. There is a major societal benefit to having these alternatives. Uh, let me go to Mr. Uh, uh, Hertzfeld. Um, the, uh, uh, you state in your report that without sufficient data, uh, defining minimum set of criteria for human spaceflight services, because we are already, let's make this very clear, we can already regulate for safety for the safety of the people on the ground. And that is already a regulatory power of, of, of this office. What we're really talking about is expanding the ability of, uh, of people to go uh, without the regulation and the massive expansion of, of regulation on the passengers who we believe can decide for themselves whether they want to step onto a spacecraft, which is, of course, the informed consent, which Mr. Wu was talking about. But if you uh, continue this, where people have that choice, and thus we don't have to have further regulation, uh, do we see uh, uh, <clears throat> this expansion of power that we're talking about uh, as a necessity for expanding the role of, uh, of this office? I think that the uh, the answer really uh, eludes us today because this industry is changing rapidly. And I see it as a process looking to the future. I was suggesting that we study different types of industry indicators, such as the, uh, the structure of the industry and maturity, how many passengers, how many uh, flights, uh, are really going to happen. We've had a lot of promises in the past. Uh, they're slow to materialize. I do believe someday they will, but I don't know when that day is. And, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, regulatory issues that we can't get around. We have air traffic control right. issues. We have a number of, uh, if we really go to outer space, we have treaty issues where the government has uh, committed to pay if there is a uh, well, well if this regulatory uh, eight year regulatory prohibition yeah. does it, uh, not expire uh, what burden uh, would would that add to the public and the industry that you see it really depends on what the FAA is prepared to do when it does expire I don't think they've been specific yet uh, if I remember the legislation correctly me and, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong that it it only gives them the option of looking at regulations when it expires. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have to. And that's why I'm suggesting we develop a process, we develop a way 
of approaching it so that if it is necessary, they can. And, and, and if we don't have any experience at that moment with uh, taking passengers up in a commercial way, how are we, gonna, how are we going to then uh, put in place regulations when we don't even have the operation happening yet? Because we don't have a significant number of passengers. And by the way, Mr. Wu, it seems that you did vote for uh, that amendment when I brought it to the floor back in 2004. <laughs> I see the wisdom of my <laughs> <laughs> All right. I yield back to my time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wu would like the opportunity to have one more question. And if the other members are so inclined, they will have an opportunity to ask one more question as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a topic which has been um, brought up repeatedly in the um, uh, commercial airline context where the FAA has responsibility for both regulating the airlines as well as promoting uh, commercial airline flight, uh, airline travel. Uh, the, the same apparently applies uh, in commercial space flight. And Dr. Hertzfeld and Dr. Dillingham, uh, I'd like each of you to comment on uh, this regime and the potential for conflict and whether this, uh, this is a good arrangement or whether, uh, as has been proposed, on the commercial airline side, that these functions ought to be separated. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Where we are now, when we looked at this issue, this, this potential conflict of interest, we did not see any at that point in time. We looked at it a few years ago. Uh, it does not mean that this situation will not change as the industry matures. And, and we have, uh, one, of, one of our concerns is that um, we not wait until there's a situation where we have this crisis and, you know, it would be like the, the air train accident. All of a sudden we realize that maybe this is not the way it should be. So our, our position is it's fine now as the industry matures. Um, we think that that separation of, um, of promotion and safety should be looked at real close and maybe, maybe commerce would be the place for the promotion aspect of it. Back, oh. I'm through. Thank you. <laughs> Back in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, the FAA really began to uh, gear up, they were only uh, regulating expendable launch vehicles. And so there didn't seem to be much of any con potential conflict between promotion and regulation at that time. Today, I agree from everything I've seen, there have, we hear no criticism from industry about uh, this dual role. And I think that will be a measure when we begin to hear complaints. Uh, and as I mentioned in the testimony, uh, we you, don't... You mean complaints about the regulatory side? Uh, no. Compl well, compl the regulatory... When you regulate, you're going to cost industry some money. And mon much regulation is, is necessary in this very risky business. It's a question of how much and how the balance and whether the same agency can successfully promote, which means trying to expand industry, while at the same time other um, parts of the same office are going to um, regulate and put uh, possibly burdens uh, and on the industry. So it's a balance between a social good and competition. Commerce traditionally has had the uh, promotion um, of industry as one of its major um, uh, mandates. Uh, but we also have the commerce has uh, the uh, stand, uh, NTIS and it has uh, uh, regulations for NOAA. It's not without regulatory authority as well. Um, I understand that the FAA has agreements with the uh, NESDIS, the space part of, um, of, the, uh, of NOAA in commerce, but uh, and so there are already some uh, building blocks of spreading the promotion of the industry uh, among other agencies. And, and I think at a point where you may be faced with this uh, delicate balance, then uh, Congress might have to look into the problem. Today, none of us, I think, have seen any uh, indications that there's a conflict there. Thank you very much, Dr. Hertzfeld. Dr. Dillingham, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Wu. Um, one of Ms. Adams from Florida has indicated she'd like to have a question. You're now recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Dr. Neal, do you believe that the uh, design and operation of pri private space flight capabilities have occurred? Do you believe they exist today? Yes, I do. So you believe that you know for a fact what the design is going to be and th therefore um, you are able to regulate that design? In our regulatory approach, we try not to be prescriptive, and so we don't specify what kinds of design of hardware or operations that a, an operator may choose. We're, we try to be performance-based, so again, we're protecting the uninvolved public. We're so you believe that the design for performance is created and therefore you can regulate it? On a top-level system safety basis, I would say the answer is yes. Okay, and that's how you're estimating how much money it will cost to um, regulate this by your budget. How long did the process of issuing the first reentry license take from application to issuance? Under the law, we are given 180 days to conduct an evaluation of a complete application package, either for launch or reentry. And uh, well, the question was very simple: How long did it take? It was about two weeks from receiving the complete package until we were able to make a decision. Now, that is an iterative process. We received the So my information that it took somewhere around a year is incorrect from the time it was applied to the time it was issued? You're telling me it's two weeks? It was about two weeks from a complete application until a decision, yes. That's not what I ask you, issuance. Someone can submit a, a cover letter and say we're going to apply for a reentry license, but that doesn't meet the intent of the regulations. So it can drag on until all of the information. Dr. Neal, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. When I ask you a specific question, I think I should at least get a specific answer. We'll move on. <laughs> Dr. Dillingham, GAO reports there will be a 45 percent increase in staffing. Do you believe there is enough certainty in the demand for on FAA to require such a dramatic increase in their staff? No, ma'am. Does GAO, GAO agree with the assertion by AST they will need the type of dramatic increases in funding they are requesting for FY12? No, ma'am. There are currently eight licensed space ports. And according to your testimony, there are, is not activity at all of them. How many space ports currently have routine flights from them? I don't think there are any spaceports that have routine flights from them. That's what I was hearing. Do you believe the billions in tax incentives, direct investments, and grants at the state and federal level for commercialization has yielded the type of fast-paced growth originally envisioned? No, ma'am. Does the increased activity GAO would expect in the next two years for suborbital Suborbital flights justify a 45 percent increase in staff and a 74 percent increase in the AST budget. No, ma'am. We've argued, uh, we, we have argued that maybe incrementally, based on the development of the industry, one could start making that move in that direction rather than Big Bang Theory. Thank you. And under your, under your understanding of the current regulatory regime, does FAA have the authority to regulate a commercial rocket launch with NASA astronauts going to station if NASA has contracted with a commercial company for the seats? I do not know the answer to that, but I can get the answer back to you. Maybe, maybe uh, Dr. Neal may help. Dr. Neal, would you like to take a shot at that? Ma'am, it would depend on how the uh, services were procured. Uh, if NASA is conducting the launch, no license is required. If NASA is having industry conduct the launch, then a license would be required under the law. What about if the commercial rocket is carrying a payload to the station? That would not be a determining factor. And again, we're working with NASA to ensure that their needs and FAA public safety needs can be met and uh, have a successful outcome of, of these types of activities. Dr. No, you've heard the discussion here, and you can see where I'm going. 74 percent increase in a time of economic restraint should be held. You're asking for us to increase your budget for a what if. I have grave concerns about that. I just want you to know that. Uh, thank you. I now recognize uh, Mr. Brooks from Alabama. 
It seems to me that the real key to whether we're going to have a private sector or commercial uh, venture in America that is successful, uh, an industry that is successful, is dependent on whether the businesses that are exploring this can make a profit. Um, short of subsidies by the federal government, and this is a question I'd like for each of you to consider, short of subsidies by the federal government, what can Congress do to reduce regulatory or other costs of commercial space ventures in order to enhance the prospect of profitability, which in turn would enhance uh, the ability of the private sector to compete in uh, space. First of all, I think having an enlightened but responsible regulator would ensure that the industry can be successful, and that's what we aim to be. Other things would include ensuring that the liability structure that is set up is appropriate to allow the businesses to compete internationally. Certainly research is an important area to the extent that we can provide the tools that the companies need to have the latest uh, rockets and, and engineering operations. That would be very important. And I think through the use of contests and prizes, the government can have a leverage effect on its investment without paying out uh, taxpayer dollars until or unless the requirements of the prize have been met. Historically, that's been a very successful incentive for industry investment. So those are the, some of the things that come to mind, sir. Uh, I, would, I would think that um, the, the current regime that's in place now, where regulation is in fact uh, uh, sort of balanced with the development of the industry, has been one of the, the, the major contributing factors to the industry moving as it as it has up to this point. It's not as fast as, as one might want it to be, but to anything that does not uh, tamp down uh, that uh, the, the idea of profit for, for the industry will be helpful, I believe. Or do you have any specifics? No, sir, not now, but I can, I can in fact, uh, get back to you with some specifics. I think all the things that uh, Dr. Neal mentioned are, uh, will help, more research and uh, more balanced approach and all the rest. But I think we have to keep in mind that for the near-term future, maybe for longer, and in the history, this is a dual use. Space is dual use. We've had private companies involved uh, for many, many years, mainly as contractors as opposed to selling services to the government. And, but the government depends on all of the private companies and always has. This is a slight change in uh, what we see in, in terms of some of the private developments and the entrepreneurial efforts. But, um, you know, it, the government's research is really what has uh, stimulated space, and probably the government's services will for quite a while. And... Um, what is happening in the commercial sector is interesting. It may take time, and, uh, but, I, but I think that our core dependence on uh, these space capabilities will remain as the primary stimulus for uh, technology uh, changes and, for, and through technology changes primarily for cost reductions. I don't believe the regulatory burden is so expensive compared to the technologies in getting to space that uh, making regulation a little less expensive is going to make a big difference in the price or supply and demand for space uh, as we go, as we move along. Uh, thank you. If there's anything uh, specific that comes to mind in the future of what we can do to help our commercial space industry be more competitive, cheaper to operate, more profitable, uh, particularly in the face of international competition, I'd welcome uh, that communication to my office. Mr. Brooks, if you'd permit me, I, Please. I think uh, one idea that builds on what uh, Dr. Hertzfeld said is, is very important, and I think that the effort that NASA has recently employed to purchase services rather than build its own rockets to operate could be a huge incentive to our industry by 
having companies design their own systems to provide cargo to the space station and someday to uh, transport astronauts, I think that could be a, a real enabler to the success of the industry in the long term that, that NASA can take advantage of and that will allow the U.S. to be competitive in this area internationally. Is the private sector now less expensive in delivering payloads to space than NASA? Absolutely. We've got the satellites. How about man? We've had only limited uh, commercial human space flight, a few flights by Spaceship One, but I think uh, in the future as industry starts to offer that option too, then I believe it will end up costing less, less than a government program as well, and that remains to be seen. But I think that's the promise of enabling our industry. Thank you. I recognize Mr. Robacher from California for our final series of questions. Mm, thank you very much. And uh, uh, let me just note that whatever money is invested by these private companies and whatever systems we have are available to us then without having to have uh, uh, to worry about budget interrogations as you've gone through today because they are, we always take it for granted that a private company is trying its very best to be as productive and as keeping those budgets down as much as they can because it, uh, there is that dynamic that doesn't exist in the federal government, in the government, because government doesn't have the same dynamic as the private sector. So, uh, uh, and we also then, if one system goes down, we have other alternatives to, uh, to choose from, as I say, compared to the shuttle, where we put all our eggs in the shuttle basket and it really uh, put us in jeopardy uh, uh, after those accidents. Uh, commercial space companies, let me note, Mr. Chairman, I believe are on the edge, uh, the cutting edge, of human progress. Uh, we've got, we now have a, a gang of industrialists, inventors, explorers, entrepreneurs, and yes, adventurers who are pushing the envelope. And this is very American, and this is very what we are supposed to be all about. And they are going into the new frontier, and uh, they are utilizing it and, and putting, taming it and finding ways of how we can utilize the great resources I, uh, that are on the frontier. I would suggest that uh, the, the area between uh, the moon and the earth will become a commercial enterprise zone, basically uh, 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 being utilized by commercial enterprises, and that NASA in the future will be looking to further exploration and, uh, and the moon and beyond and, de and developing new technologies. But we have reached, and, and your, your point about uh, well, developing the technology, that's really uh, where the cost is as compared to regulatory cost. Well, that's true, but we have reached the plateau on the development of technologies now that will permit commercial uh, enterprise, uh, and those technologies are there, and the cost has already been paid. So I would say at this point the regulatory burden is what is uh, probably the greatest threat in holding us back from utilizing that space between the Earth and the Moon for the benefit of humankind. Uh, the, uh, this is very similar to the time period during the, during the, the last half of the last century uh, when aviation was developed, what, 1903, the first plane that went off, and uh, at a certain point it became possible through contracts, mail contracts, through war contracts, dual use with military and, and civilian use. We, civilian airlines became profitable, became a potential. We are at that point right now with commercial space. And let me congratulate the Obama administration, uh, which you will rarely hear from me. <laughs> and they have managed to see this where some of my own colleagues on the Republican side, which always who always talk about enterprise and keeping costs down and making profit ventures, uh, don't seem to have, have grasped what this administration has grasped. And that is, if the more money that's invested in the private sector and the more potentially profit we're making for these uh, entrepreneurs, that means there will be more money for NASA and other people to do their job and expand the potential of human activity in space. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for a very important hearing, and I'm looking forward in the days ahead 
uh, to working with you to make sure that we reach our America reaches its potential both with NASA and in the commercial area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warbacher, and thank you for stepping in for me while I had to go to another committee to cast a vote. Um, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses. We will ask you to respond to those in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are excused, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.